I remember I had a classmate and we marched down like we were giving out to our teacher we were like well why is there no girls Gaelic team like why are the boys because there's a patch of grass outside our classroom do you know and I could see the boys and, and that was the first memory I have of standing up and saying what about us do you know what about the girls Hello everyone and you're very, very welcome to this special webinar hosted by the Inclusivity Committee in Leinster Rugby to celebrate Pride Month and Leinster Rugby being a home for all as we aim to make all sport a home for all. That's the, the ultimate goal of this. Uh, we're also very, very grateful to Bank of Ireland for their support of the webinar as we look to discuss the theme of building allies in pride. And we have brilliant guests for you to discuss that and, and maybe look back a bit and, and look forward and get excited about the future as sport and rugby becomes more and more inclusive because that's what it's there for after all. So let me introduce who is on this webinar for you today. Uh, this woman is just a legend of Irish sport. Lindsay Peat, an All-Ireland medal with Dublin, has played in the Six Nations, has played underage soccer for Ireland, basketball for Ireland, rugby for Leinster. She is a sporting legend and she's with us today. Jack Dunn, a man who's starting off an incredible sporting career. He's represented Ireland uh, in the second row at under 20s level. And has had 15 outings for Leinster already, a far more to come, I guess. Richie Fagan, he is uh, a member of the Emerald Warriors, a team that was set up for the LGBT community back in 2003. And it's absolutely flying. It's good to have Richie with us today. Craig Maxwell Keys. Craig is a member of uh, the RFU's elite refereeing panel, has refereed some of the biggest matches in the game, is also a keen and very important supporter of the Rainbow Laces campaign in England, came out himself and has used his story to help people guide them through what can be a really difficult time. Great to have Craig with us as well. And Maura Flaheev, who is chair of Leinster Rugby's Inclusivity Committee and uh, a driving force in making sure rugby is a sport for all. Great to have all of you with us today for this. Looking forward to chatting to you. Okay, so, well, good to see you all. Thanks for joining us today. Lindsay, I read, a, there's a, an Irish Times article I'm sure you're familiar with. And I know we're moving away from just the topic of discussion for just a moment, but I love this. Uh, it's from um, Girls Play 2. There once was a girl called Lindsay. In 2009, she played a senior international basketball match for Ireland in the afternoon and then was flown by helicopter to play in an all Ireland quarterfinal against Kerry that evening amazing but later on in this article and i know i'm moving off course a little bit um imagine for just a second says this article that a man did all of these things his mug will be splashed across Connolly station bridge so people marching onto croker could see him his brand would amass seven figure annual returns from a post-career media profile he'd be a household name loved or despised with everyone agreeing he's an athletic freak just one of the other challenges i guess when you're not a standard bloke playing sport in Ireland. Uh, it's not just about sexuality. It, it, it's about many things, isn't it, Lindsay? Yeah, um, it was a fantastic article, uh, except one that I suppose it, it kind of is bittersweet. Um, I was quite embarrassed at the article uh, that came from uh, uh, Graham. He's he. I had the pleasure of him being in, in SNC. He's with Wexford Hurlers there, um, and. He was so supportive and he, he also was in the very successful uh, Stephen Kenny era with Dundalk uh, soccer team as well. So I've been very privileged with um, between SSC coaches, both men and female um, head coaches. I've been very lucky in my journey, but I suppose there is part of me that needs to remember that my journey also includes what we're here about today, which is equality for also gender in sport. And um, thankfully it is changing. Um, I'm probably unfortunately not going to be around much longer to reap the rewards, but I will sit back as someone I would hope being um, who has put the shoulder to the wheel and driven female sports to 
um, the standard and into the, the eye of the media and into the light that it should be seen and enjoyed by all. So, um, look, I just adore sport. I've adored, you know, its companionship over 20 years now. And I've enjoyed discussions like this to how we can use sport to be a really positive force to drive change. Um, so, yeah, all in all, it's a pretty emotional journey um, and one that I've I've obviously thoroughly enjoyed and been very privileged to wear four very different, important and very close jer- jerseys close to my heart that have represented um, all of my communities that I love and adore. And I'm a very proud dub. As Richie Fagan started off the conversation with his posh, scary accent, I was like, here's the Artane one now, bring Lauren the phone. <laughs> but um, yeah. Look, very proud of that. Of you know, as I said, I've represented that day. By the way, I'm absolutely mortified that I got a helicopter. I thought, um, I thought the coach was uh, Jerry was um, you know pulling you know kind of pulling the piss out of me, saying, "Oh, we'll get you a helicopter." We were playing Luxembourg in the National Basketball Arena, um, and I was like, "Where do you get the boat? I'm not getting a helicopter." And lo and behold, I'm in Ar- White Ireland basketball kit heading to I think it was Nolan Park to play uh, Kerry and I literally got to change into my Dublin gear and run out onto the sideline or I think onto the pitch for possibly 30 seconds it was ridiculous but um I believe maybe some other athlete stars have have been treated that way more more frequently but uh it's definitely an embarrassing story but one I can laugh at thankfully now and it's interesting because your career you know it's spanned decades um You've seen a lot of change, a lot more acceptance, a lot more inclusion. Are we heading in the right direction, Indy? 100%. I'll tell you one of my, my most heartbreaking stories, Craig, is when actually, um, so 2009, I played both. And in 2010, actually, I was co-captain with Michelle Fahey, another great basketball uh, athlete in her own right, um, went to scholarship in the States, you name it. And um, our team was pulled altogether from international setup uh, due to financial reasons. And I can tell you, um, we got sponsorship from at the time an offer from Satanta Sports to say that basically kind of a uh, part payment to 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 show our games uh, live on telly. And the other part would be kind of a loan. And uh, unequivocally, our association said no. And we cost uh, one third of what the men's team cost. The lads would stay in hotels. They'd get a, a mini bus. Now, this is nothing against the lads. This is just the way it was. And we actually accepted it. This is the most embarrassing part. We actually accepted it because we were so privileged to play for Ireland. And we didn't want to ruffle any feathers, rock any boats. Um, and we used to stay in each other's houses. At times, it did progress on. We were staying in hotels. But we I think our program cost 50000 and the men's cost 150000 And we found very, we we felt very grieved that we were pulled when we didn't cost that much money. We were like, we can fundraise, we can bag pack, we could get fifty grand, no problem. And for that decision to be taken away from us when we were at, and we were one game away from being promoted from up to Division One, which no Irish team had done. We were the first Irish team, but for men and women to beat the Dutch at home, it was. Like, I mean, these were, I, I scored a shot from between, the buzzer was about to go. I took a shot from between the three point and a half way line and went in. These are one of these days where memories are made. Like these are sporting moments that never happen once in a lifetime. And um, yeah, it was just pulled from, the rug was pulled from under us. So now to see international basketball, even in COVID for, for the Irish senior women's to be back up and running to get as much media as attention. Um, Leinster Rugby have been a huge um, advocate for, for female rugby. And um, obviously we're going to Twickenham uh, in 2019 to play Harlequins as part of their Big 12 um, game. It was It's one of my favourite rugby games. This, um you know, the big, uh, I don't even know what they're called, just these big jets of fire as you come into the stadium. We've seen the men's game before. We were treated like royalty. It was one of my most enjoyable. I played at um, at number six uh, in the back row, which was a dream come true. So I didn't have to play loose head. Um, so I was able to just play loose. And it was one of my favourite games. And again, it, it epitomised the progress that we've made throughout um, throughout sport, especially for, for the female side of things. Standard 27 tackles. Yeah. Oh no, I was actually running them up, uh, kind of running <laughs> off Tene's shoulder, trying to get. I, I, I ran the whole nearly. We ran the whole length of the pitch, I think, and then I just didn't finish off the try. There were so many positives. That was definitely a negative, though. I, I should have finished off. She was cutting through the Harlequins defense. She was making it easy. I was just running for the pop pass. <laughs> that was fantastic. fantastic. Like all good, back, like all good back roads. Like Absolutely. all good back roads. Sitting the shoulder of the pace. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Jack, good to see you with us. Uh, a touch of D'Artagnan about you, I have to say, today, the hair and the beard. Good, it's good look. I'm liking <laughs> Thanks, it. Thanks, Dan. You're for a while. Um, uh, you're injured at the moment, Jack. How's the body? Yeah, it's, it's doing all right. So I broke my ankle back end of March, um, and it's got, it got infected. So that set me back a couple of weeks, but come along all right other than that. I was trying to think, Jack, of the, the only other Irish or Leinster player I know who who came out was a guy called Paul O'Connor who, who's a well, very well known triathlon circles these days. A giant of a man played played for Lansdowne and, and Leinster, and he was all, he was also a second row. And I remember him coming out, and it was God, it must be fifteen years ago, and it was such a big deal that day, you know. And I thought after that, oh great, great, you know, the seal's been broken now, and everyone will kind of you know free, feel feel free to come out and be themselves and the best version of themselves and. And yet again, when when you decide to come out, it's it's still a big story. Does that surprise yeah. you? It's strange in some way looking across probably more male professional sport. I think that's probably more open in the female professional world. But um, yeah, there's not that many sports people across a lot of sports that have come out. And it seems to be a headline in almost every sport when someone still comes out. So yeah, it is a bit strange. You, you just think purely on probability that there'd be more people who have come out. How was it for you in, in a rugby context, in a professional rugby context, uh, making that decision to, 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 to be yourself publicly? Yeah, I suppose. I, so I came out in sixth year and it was grand. So, so it, it, there wasn't really professional rugby thought in my head at that stage. I, I, I was obviously quite good at rugby in school and I had intentions of playing for the Irish 20s, but I wasn't sure if I actually wanted to go a further step and become a professional so I probably hadn't thought about it that much in terms of that uh, but ever since transitioning into the Leinster setup it, you know it's been all positive everyone's been really accepting and it's, it's a really great setup that they have there Can I talk to you about banter dressing room chat yeah. what's okay what's not okay yeah. <laughs> like uh, I have a good sense of humour I'll take any gags like as long as they're like meant in good faith you know you've no issue with someone uh, making a joke like it's not a hush hush taboo topic you can chat about it I don't mind all that stuff it's just you know obviously you know where the line is if you're just going in on someone then that's not okay but you know happy enough to take any joke it's interesting wasn't it Craig good to have you with us by the way thanks so much and I know you're involved with Rainbow Laces and you looked at the the Harlequins report that came out recently enough about homophobia and rugby and uh, and one of the standout stats for me, the shocking stats, was that the, the amount of homophobic language that's deemed okay or people think is okay in sport. T- tell us about that and, and your view on that. Um, yeah, I think the more interesting stat as well for me was the same number of people want it to stop. So if they if they then go and practice what they preach, we're in a better position, aren't we? Um, but no, similar to what what Jack said, I think. It's knowing where the line is. And if, if they're allies and it's in good faith, then it's very different to someone who is just taking, um, taking a cheap shot. Um, but equally, it's, it's, a, it's a double-edged sword, as I see it, because we want, we want people to ask questions. But if they're so scared of asking questions because they may phrase it the wrong way or say the wrong thing, we're never going to start a conversation. So it's, it's finding that balance for me between the two. Uh, your, your own story, Craig, uh, you had a WhatsApp message written to all your friends and all your colleagues. In the, in the sporting world uh, to tell them uh, that you're going to come out. Um, and it sat in your phone for quite a long time. Why so? What did it say? Oh, it's a really long WhatsApp message. And yeah, they've not let me forget I sent that at 6 a.m. waking them all up. Um, for some reason, none of my colleagues seem to have their phones on mute. Um, you know, it took a long time to send it. It took a long time to send it probably because I was new into the role as a professional sort of athlete, didn't really know the inside of professional sport because um, I had no idea I was about to go full-time as a ref um, hadn't even considered it as an option um, so I suppose I just wanted to make myself comfortable in a new environment before I before I sent it um, but I said in the the program notes I did for the game at the weekends that um, my biggest regret or embarrassment is not trusting those around me sooner because there was no doubt they were going to be supportive it was me that doubted them easy to say of hindsight I know but yeah, I should have should have trusted them a lot sooner and sent it a lot sooner. And Nigel Owens, when he came out, it was it was such a huge story. And again, I similarly was saying to Jack about Paul O'Connor, Nigel on a, on, a, on a bigger scale. Of course, we thought, oh great, okay, now we can stop having this conversation. 
Um, yeah, we're still having the conversation. Yeah, we are. I mean, I, I sat down with Nigel before I, I did the piece a few years ago for Rainbow Oasis um, in the, the exotic place of Nando's over in Wales because he wanted the point. He's so classy. He's so classy. But he's got the top membership, whatever that is, at Nando's, so he's happy with life. <laughs> um, but no, I sat down with him and, and yeah, um, you'd have thought it would be less of a story, um, especially as I came out three years before I did that, that media piece. So it was pretty, pretty well known. At least I thought it was, but apparently not. You do you do the piece, and yeah, your phone goes into into meltdown. But you'll take it because the reaction is so positive, and that probably reflects how far we have come. Yes, there's further to go, but that in itself is a barometer that it was well received. Hi, Maura. How are you? I'm great, Greg. How are you? Great to be I'm here great. this afternoon. Thanks a million for agreeing to do this. And again, I know you've already thanked the Bank of Ireland, but. Uh, you got to get yourself to Enniskerry Village and have a look at Disney now. That'll well, blow your you head know, off. <laughs> I used to live in Enniskerry. I had my 21st birthday party in the Summerhill Hotel there. That was only about two years ago, for those watching. Of course, of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, I remember when Nigel came out, Nigel Owens came out, and there was such a positive response to him coming out. And then about three weeks later, I was at a game and I was sitting just below the press box. And I heard a member of the press, not a leading member, might I add, but coming out with a homophobic comment after Nigel made a bad decision. And then people laughing. And I thought, oh, my word. Why does he think that's OK? Why does he think that's OK? There's, there's a big gulf between what people think is acceptable and what is actually acceptable. And what they think is acceptable is still so damaging, isn't it? Yeah. It is. Um, and I think everybody's used that word today, a conversation, you know, um, and it's starting that conversation. That conversation, I believe, has started. I think the door has been well and truly opened, if not forcibly kicked down at this stage. I think we're looking at a time of real acceleration for people wanting to learn, for people having experiences like you just said there now and saying, God, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to go to a game and hear that. I don't want my son or my daughter, my brother, my sister, my neighbor, my friend, my ally, to hear that, you know? Um, and so I think the words are turning into actions. Um, and if you just look at what Leinster are doing at the minute, the creation of the committee that I'm chairing, um, while we have for the first couple of seasons been looking at the big ticket item of, of, of women's rugby, we're now having an opportunity to address other areas that come under our remit like LGBTQ uh, plus in L rugby in Leinster and obviously beyond there. And I think just talking about it, that's where we are at the top and the intent of Leinster by creating a committee that affords the chair, who I was lucky enough to be asked to do this job and the on sex seats on the management committee and the executive committee in Leinster rugby, it really shows that they mean business. It's all well and good for a club to say, well, we're going to be inclusive um, and diverse, and we're going to try and promote that. But what clubs can do to really, really help those words turn into actions is to make a practical statement of intent by giving and affording people who can work in that area for the benefit of their club and their community in turn, um, a bit of clout, do you know, um, around the table. And that makes a big, big difference. And it shows that people mean business in this regard um, and uh, I am as I said really excited about this 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 month um, I'm, I've been working a lot with Richie in the Emerald Warriors and um, the on sec of the committee of the inclusivity committee is a woman called uh, Lorna Quinn who is fantastic and uh, we've all been working together to figure out where we're going to go with the committee when we start up our work again in September uh, in this little area of our of our current remit and our current work and we've decided that what we're going to do is try to devise content for um, an educational program, I think, for clubs. Because, again, it's all well and good saying that we don't want to experience those, those situations. But how do we help clubs and players right from the grassroots up, which is Leinster's modus operandi? How do we help everybody to learn a little bit about it? Do you know? Um, now, there's some clubs that are miles down the road in this regard. They're leading the way and they're trailblazers and they're fantastic. They're looking in the rear view mirror, you know, um, at other clubs. But there are other clubs who want to try and do something in the area of inclusivity and diversity and 
LGBTQ rights and including those players, their children, um, same-sex families, all in their club because they are all part of their community and the club is part of their community. And how do they go about doing that? Well, we're here to help. We want to create this educational and awareness program and we're going to take our time. Um, it's going to be included in the um, inclusivity and diversity tab on our website, ultimately. Um, clubs are going to be able to engage with that and it's going to be real tangible help and support there. Um, it's, it's fantastic work and making uh, words become reality, I hope. You know, that's, that's the hope of everybody here today, I think. Um, and next year, when we've got Pride Month on, my plan anyway, whether that's to know it or not, is that we're going to have our big banner there and we're going to be marching up and down the street and bring out the feather boas and the, and the, uh, and the disco zagabons. And it's just hopefully in a couple of years' time, you won't be hearing from me at all. There won't be a need for this committee. The talking will be over and it will hopefully be embedded and it'll be a new world. You know, so that's, that's why I'm loving the work that I'm doing at the minute, I have to tell you. I mean, Richie, Emerald Warriors are those trailblazers, 2003 mm -hmm. setting up. Um, and just, I just wonder why was it needed in 2003? Okay, well, you know what? Hello, I, by the way, Richie, say hello. <laughs> hello, by the way. Very hey there, expensive Chris. arse over your, expensive arse over your right shoulder. You've done well in life. <laughs> really. uh, thanks, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> nice distraction. But uh, yeah, no, you're right. Like 2003, I wasn't involved in the club in 2003. Uh, but, you know, the, the five guys who set up back then, they really did put their head above the parapet. And, you know, it, you know, when you think about 2003 now, Craig, you know, 2015, we brought like, was the marriage referendum. And like a lot of people kind of forget how difficult even times were back then, even though 20, 2003 wasn't that long ago. But um, the club, yeah, like, starting out with just five members then quickly growing to kind of you know having 30 members and then competing in the Leinster Metro League within like two or three years to where we are today you know with two if not three teams and I know you know coming out of COVID but like before COVID we were you know with a, a development squad two teams in the Leinster Metro League you know go abroad every year compete in, in tours ab abroad and and we've, like, we do have to from time to time remind ourselves where we've come you know we hosted the union cup or sorry the bingham cup in 2008 and that was the kind of first of its kind in in the country and the, the support they got was phenomenal and then you know 2019 when we hosted the union cup and uh, like your, your, nigel Lawrence was very much involved garen thomas and you know, you know we we kind of changed the dial then as well in that like every union cup up to that year was pretty much men's focus and we said no if, if we're bringing that to Ireland we want to change the dollar that has to include the women's side of the tournament um, and you know now going forward there will be a women's side in every Union Cup um, and you know we had the phenomenal Lindsay Pete involved the you know, incredible support from Bank of Ireland who came on board who you know there was no hard sell they, they literally were in straight away when they knew what we were about knew what we were trying to do in terms of you know changing up the dial with diversity inclusion in the Union Cup itself and also you know when they got involved in understanding what we're about in the club but you know the the stats unfortunately do show why there is a need for a club like ourselves you know when we look into our own community like why is there only 17 percent of our own community involved in rugby or participating in a competitive sport so we're very passionate about changing those stats and um, we're incredibly excited uh, to be working with, you know, the phenomenal Mora there and the amazing work that they're doing in the inclusivity committee. Um, and we're, you know, I, I feel like we're on the cusp of something very special and, uh, you know, it's taken quite a while, but we're, we're really making big inroads right now. Why do people join your club? Why do they feel they have to? Um, they, like, they want to give it a go. They want, they feel obviously that some of some of the guys that come through the case studies that come through the club, they would have fallen out of rugby at a certain point. They might have played sports. Some may have never played before, but some is that because have. of their sexuality? Do you think, Richie? Is 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 that is that one of the reasons? Absolutely, because like even in those stats, Craig. Like if you look at the seventy percent that compete, and it's interesting that you mentioned the Harlequins research, which we've looked at, which is phenomenal. But out of that seventeen percent, fifty-six percent would have experienced homophobic slurring. 
or etc uh, you know on the pitch so you know, there is a lot to be said about you know people falling out at a certain point but you know doing what we do like we're, we we you know, try and bring as many people back in and a lot of the guys come back in their 20s or sometimes even a bit later um, and they find that they've a whole new lease of life where, um, and, and it completely some of the case studies are unbelievable like some of the lads who have come through our pathway program you know you look at them they've never picked up a rugby ball before and they're playing on our first team in our final at the end of the season you know so um, like there's still a, a, a job to be done we're constantly looking at, you know, improving on that job. We're, you know, even this season, we're increasing on our coaching. We're changing up the gear there on that. We're, uh, you know, gone into a whole new area of non-contact. You know, there will be permanent non-contact teams running inside the club as well as our full contact. Um, but we are, you know, passionately trying to bring more of our community to the game. Lindy uh, and and Jack and 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 Craig, uh, your exp- I mean, this is largely a positive conversation because we're moving forward. But let's just take a moment to, to maybe reflect on some of the negative experiences the three of you have, or are currently have, or have on a regular basis. Could three of you just kind of chat between between yourselves and let us listen in on, on how that's been for you. What what things have shocked you? I'll let you start, Jack. I suppose uh, talking about like the Harlequins report and. If you'd hear bad stuff like th- by like people saying homophobic language and things like that, I think all the time people just don't even think about what they're saying. I know, like, definitely a couple of years ago, you'd hear it a lot, and maybe I didn't have the confidence at the time, but I've certainly managed to develop the confidence to say it to people like, "Man, you can't say that." I know you're probably not even thinking about it, but just be more conscious. And ninety nine percent of the time, they're like sorry, yeah, you're completely right. I wasn't thinking at all. So I I think it's more just, it comes from a place of ignorance than malice a lot of the time when people do have bad experiences. Is stuff said to you on the pitch, Jack? Not on the pitch, no. I never would have had like abuse from other teams. Now, in fairness, I'd say most of the other teams probably wouldn't know because I haven't done anything media-wise. I know like I'd play against guys who I played just like, on under 20s with and they'd all know but they'd never give me any shite about it because you know they're they're good folks like you're also huge you would knock the head off them so <laughs> that's, a, that's important um jack are you surprised uh, and craig as well that that when you when you hear richie talk about about the emerald warriors that it that a team like that a modern day is actually needed you know that some people don't feel it at home in a, in a in a rugby club they have got to go somewhere where they feel more at home in their, their own community surprise you I suppose I, I'm probably not surprised. Like when I was thinking about coming out, I actually consciously waited until my sixth year rugby season was over because I, you know, I cared about rugby so much. I I didn't want it to even possibly be a thing. So I I can completely understand why there is a need for that. But you went to say Michael's Jack. You're always going to get a Leinster contract. <laughs> just the production line. They they just pay you off now, right? You just like. Can't deal with the rocks anymore, and you're down the mic. We know what's happening there. Uh, Craig, how, how, how about you? Because obviously there's the King's Cross Steelers, I, I guess, led the charge many years. Is King's Cross Steelers, am I right? And oh, yeah. I had them in the studio, yeah. Um, but, but still, but still, people are, are cautious about coming out and where they play their rugby. Yeah, like, like Jack, I'm not surprised there's a need for it. And I think you probably hit the nail on the head as well in terms of I too lacked the confidence to challenge people when they have used language that wasn't done in the right spirit. I think that's the biggest step we still need to take forward is ourselves, our allies, empowering them to then help educate others. And as you say, when you do challenge people, they're normally the first to admit they shouldn't have used that that sort of language. And I mean, you mentioned it earlier, like why did it take me so long to send that WhatsApp? At the very time I was initially considering sending it, I was part of a conversation where a colleague not a full-time colleague, but a member of the wider refereeing fraternity, said, oh, if you want to go up the refereeing ladder, just come out as gay. And games will start flooding your way. So then you start doubting yourself. It's a case of, well, should I come out? Because if I suddenly start getting appointments, it's not going to be because I've earned more merit in their eyes. It's because I've come out as gay. So there's comments like that, which, yeah, we are very unsure of yourself and still closeted that will knock people's confidence and affect them in ways that that person's naive to. But the best way to counter that is to, is to call it out. It's how you get confidence to call them out. 
across as many people as possible, which link it to Harlequins and the Pride match they had again at the weekend just gone. And the more exciting thing there is the work that Quinn's Foundation is doing, is that's actually out in the community, dealing with kids, adults, a whole range of people across the whole community. It's the work those, those initiatives are doing, which help empower people because it raises that awareness and starts that conversation and just better informs people. I think that's the, the hard work behind the scenes that often goes unnoticed that makes a lot of difference. Lindsay, still locking down the Ireland scrum at, at the age of 40, 40. Sorry to mention it. Um, I'm so <laughs> <more>, 29. <laughs> <laughs> you, would have, you would have seen so much change. I'm just wondering on the pitch, in the dressing rooms, how, how different has it become over the last couple of years? Hugely. Has it at I all? Think, okay. I think the one thing we need to remember, and, and firstly, just before we move on, uh, before I forget, and it's not that I get bombarded with talking too much, uh, Maura and Richie and to Lorna Quinn and to Leinster and to obviously Bank of Ireland and everyone who supported um, the committee and to bring, like Maura said, to have an actual committee um, is shown great leadership and being role models within Leinster and education is the word that's been repeated in the last few minutes to change social norms and to change the way we think and we act and how we say is about educating people. And that's one of the things to be a good ally is to educate those around you and to stand up for people, online abuse and have no acceptance on any level. And that's what we're hearing here today. And that's a huge thing about educating from grassroots. And this also comes from being a parent. I have a son that I'm trying to educate to understand that there's different diverse um, personalities, people, families, and you just have to judge the person on who they are and what values they bring to your life. Like Craig shouldn't be, nor Jack, nor myself, nor Richie, nor more. Anybody should not be judged on their playing ability by their sexuality. That's what we want to eliminate here. Um, but I've seen huge change. And, and probably the other big thing is, is when when we go back to the Emerald Warriors and setting up specific clubs, one of the main barriers is you, you're struggling with your own self-acceptance and coming to terms with your own sexuality. So if you're trying to, if you're struggling with that, you will have ideas in your head like Craig might have had before he sent his WhatsApp message. No more than it took me 10 years to come out and I'm dressed as Captain America, not really at myself at my 30th birthday and announced to the world outside of my family who already knew that I was gay. And it took that just leap of faith kind of just jumping off a cliff two feet hold your breath and hope the best happens you're, you're building all this captain america i think they knew yeah is that classy or is that classy <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i was dressed as captain america and to be honest my now wife who was my girlfriend at the time organized this surprise party and i didn't want to be ashamed and not thank her openly and publicly for being just amazing and 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 giving her the credit that she had deserved because she true love had set up this amazing party included all my friends all my family and uh, I'd great crack my Dublin teammates who dressed up one of them dressed up as a we'd beat Tyrone that year in the All-Ireland final and she um dressed up in a Tyrone full kit and she'd like a bloody nose and a you know bandage around her head it was just brilliant and nothing nothing was said to me that night everyone kind of you know I had built it up in my head but because of visibility because we weren't having the conversations because we weren't open about all the different diverse peoples within our community there was a stigma with it I had built this all up in my head and like Craig had said I didn't trust the people who loved me that they just continued to love me for who I am who I was the person I was and what value I brought to their lives and now like to be involved in quite a substantially younger playing group and um, it's fantastic to see just how open they are and how you know it do, nothing would face them you know um I can talk about my wife my son and they'll talk about you know their gay friends in college and um, you know people who are on Erasmus and you know from just different backgrounds and there's nothing there's no I've never had um any of the back you know the I suppose the dressing room banter, we have great crack and there's no elephant in the room. And I suppose I certainly am one when I'm uncomfortable, try to use humor. So I probably slag myself in, in my regard. And I, I've i tried to check myself with that to make sure that I'm not going over the line, that I am still making sure there's respect for everybody, because at the end of the day, I am a role model within that group as an older group and to make sure that everyone is treated uh, respectfully. So yeah, when I started basketball, I think there was one openly gay player 
Um, I had a fabulous journey. They just allowed me to be me. But then as I progressed through football, there was a bit more um, openness for people's sexuality, a lot more visibility. I felt a lot more comfortable within their company and I was starting to come to terms and, and being in circles of friends. And that's where the Emma Warriors are so important that it helps you to come um, to terms with yourself before you have the confidence to come out and be ready to, to possibly weather any storm and, and, you know, take on the fight that may be needed. But thankfully, I've had very little. It's been all positive. I had one um, a slur against me in, a, in an All-Ireland final. But other than that, not to my face anyway, possibly behind my back, but nothing. And I'd be always very aware to now, as I said, be very mindful of the language I'm using. Um, and, and how long did that player? Um, how long did that player spend in hospital? Uh, thankfully, I was just like, right, don't lose your absolute shit here. I was on the left. I was left wing forward, and most female players um, at the time were right foot. So I'm like, Ron, I'm like, give me the ball. I am going to absolutely try and make her life hell. Um, <laughs> so thankfully, look, at the end of the day, uh, we won that day, and um, yeah. Sport has played a big journey in my coming out story and, and that's why I'm a huge advocate. And the, and the Union Cup was testament. I just think it was, it brought to the surface everything that's good about sport. Um, and like even my dad, who me and him have a much better relationship because I was honest and open once I came out, like he made such an effort to come to the Union Cup that day to make sure he supported us and the amount of families that were there. And um like Bank of Ireland coming on board, uh, Guinness, Vodafone, because they're big leaders and make big impacts. And I think these studies have shown with like the f- fact that male players made such an effort to, um, that's what being an ally is about, is using your power to to get out there, be vocal and support. And and sometimes I think um, we're looking for this big gesture, but sometimes it's just the small gestures that make big impacts. Um, and that's what happened, thankfully, for Union Cup. And I can't thank Richie again and the Emma Warriors for including the female side of things, because, again, it was a huge statement in what it means uh, for equality. Uh, Jack and Craig, I want to get you on the ally thing in a moment. Before that, though, um, Richie and Moira, I interviewed um, Kate Richardson Walsh, the England uh, hockey captain, GB hockey captain from the Olympic win. And we were talking about women in sport and stigma. It was with Gareth Thomas as well. And they were saying, like, the stigma attached to women in rugby is that all female rugby players are lesbians. And that all male rugby players are butch, big blokes, you know. Uh, so it's a, it, it's a, a kind of different battle in a weird, mixed up kind of way. Um, but it's stigma. It's stigma all the same. Uh, could the two of you discuss that for us here and, and how you break that down? It seems almost impossible. Oh, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we we learned an awful lot, Greg, from uh, when we went on that journey to, to bring the women's side to the tournament in Union Cup and like when we worked so well with Lindsay and so many others. Uh, we like understood that sometimes in, for women in sport, they like the straight women struggle coming out as straight, you know what I mean? And, and But we, what we did learn was how incredibly inclusive and the way that they work together. And we, we, we chat, we, we talk about it an awful lot in the club, but yeah, it's funny you say that. And I, I do think we are hopefully, you know, changing that. Like there's a huge catalyst now in, in, in what's going on with, with the work we're doing with more at Leinster and Bank of Ireland to, to, to break down those stigmas and break down those, uh, you know, barriers for whether it be women in sport, but also for what we're seeing with people coming out and being comfortable in coming out. Uh, but yet, yeah, no, it, it's funny. We 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 have learned an awful lot from it. Uh, I, I don't know what else to say to you, Craig, on that one. But well, I, I think Richie and I have uh, been on a few panels together now recently. We've never met in person, but I feel like I've got a new brother. You know. Um, over this COVID, which is fantastic, obviously. Richie knows that. Um, as, Craig, I think your question was, you know, what, if anything, can be done about those common perceptions? Well, here we go. This is one thing, you know. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, the ONSEC uh, of the Inclusivity Committee, Lorna, you know, I say to her, so how does it feel, you know, to be in the minority there? She's a straight married woman with children. Uh, you know, how does that feel? Um, and uh, we have a good laugh about that, you know. Um, and I think Jack alluded to it earlier as well. Statistically, it's impossible for there to be no 
gay LGB, well, gay male professional sports people, or essentially none across every sport. It, it, it's not possible. So if we roll back from that, how do we make it, um, how do we make sport from the grassroots up? Because these, these men were not always men, they were boys and they were playing with other boys, playing their sport and um, with girls and with their brothers and sisters and um, in their communities. And um, so it's been a pro pro progress for them up to a point either where they feel that they can't for whatever reason. Um, but where does that start? And I think that again, going back to try to um, help clubs, you know, from the grassroots up, if you were trying to describe your club, what would you say about your club or what would somebody in your community say about your club? Is it somewhere that your young neighbor who's coming to terms with their sexuality feels safe enough to either come out or not come out, but to take their time and to stick with the sport, not to throw in the towel. I think that's really important because as Richie pointed out earlier, so many um, young people, when they're coming to terms with their sexuality and they realize I, I might be gay, God, I, I can't play rugby, you know, or, or whatever it is, soccer or Gaelic or hockey or whatever it is. I mean, I played hockey when I was a girl, there was no girls rugby. Um, and uh, even though I grew up in a rugby house, um, and it's interesting, similarly, a lot of women who play hockey at an elite level are gay. I don't know of any male hockey players that are. Again, it can't, it can't be right. So how do we make that a safe place for them to A, stick with whatever sport they're playing, not to leave? And if we're talking about rugby today and in Leinster. We want to make it people, clubs realize, keep the young people involved. And when they're ready, if they're ready, make sure you have an environment where they can say, um, after the game, well, you know, I'm going to ask my boyfriend to come for a pint. And it's great. Happy days. You've so hit on something there, Jack and Craig. You'll pick up on this, I'm sure. That's why people have to feel comfortable about coming out because you can't hide a part of your life. You should be able to say, actually, my fella, my girlfriend, my wife, they're, they're joining me later. You won't believe the row I had with my partner last night. These are normal conversations that you have to have within a team for it to bond. Jack, uh, did, did that play in your mind when you, when you came out that it was just impossible not to share this side of your life? Um, I suppose, so, so I'm bisexual, so it, in a, it's kind of a blessing and a curse that you can hide it a lot better because in obviously in some ways it's easier just to keep it hidden, but then at the same time you're not being true to yourself and you're not accepting it. So I suppose, yeah, it definitely did play on my mind. Like it was almost is this the choice I have to make between playing rugby and be, being who I am? So, yeah, as Richie was saying earlier, like so many people drop out of the sport when they're 17 and then they come back 10 years later and realise this is something I really love. And you wonder how many people across all sorts of sports, they just stuck with it, would have gone on to do great things. How about you, Craig? No, 100%. Um... But the biggest thing, you forget how much energy for me it took or how much focus it took to remember what I said to what people. And then you, you, like you can't, I can never relate to the comment, lift the weight, until I came out. And then I genuinely realised how much energy it was consuming trying to sow this web of deceit to different people. And if you happen to do that at a rugby club, at work, wherever, it just at some point, something's going to have to give somewhere. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's a massive factor. That's so interesting, Craig. That's so exhausting. Oh my word, your brain it, never switches off, right? It never switches off. You're and then like, so in fact, it massively affected how much I socialized. I think people probably thought I was the most boring person ever. In fact, I probably still am. But you don't want to go out and get drunk because you're then very concerned about shit. What am I going to say? Am I going to say something that someone then realizes I've contradicted a story I said earlier and go what, and catch me out? So you're so scared of that that you end up starting to shut yourself off from people. It's very controlled who you interact with and when. So, Richie, this is it. Let's simplify it here, right? Nobody can live like that. Your rugby club, people don't have to live like that because they're amongst friends, people they can trust, allies. We need every club to be like that. 100%. Absolutely. And like we very passionately, when we did in 2018, a very small bit of research with grassroots clubs and we asked them, 
Had they ever heard of a tournament called Junior Cup or had they ever heard of LGBT in sport? And like, it was, you know, it was grim. <laughs> no one knew, you know, they, there wasn't anyone. We knew we had a job in hand to do to kind of bring in grassroots clubs, invite them into the tournament, see what it's about, normalising what it is, see how competitive it is, see that there is no difference. And even with that small piece, you know, we invited families in. We said, no, come in, you know, even, you know, I asked my nephew to come in with his team and play at halftime, like halftime minis would happen in, in the world, yes. And we did all of that with many different clubs. And that to me was like the feedback I got from parents, like even a year or two later was really powerful because, you know, they were a lot more engaged with us and our club. And also when we went into grassroots rugby clubs, just to present what we were about and the, the ambition we had for the tournament at that time, well, they, that was probably the most powerful piece. You know, your phone was hopping then a day or two later going, oh, look, I've seen that presentation you did. Look, how can I get involved? How can I understand, you know, to support you guys in, in bringing this tournament and making it the biggest and the best of what it was in 2019? That's it, Greg. We, 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 we welcome so many, like we bring in allies. We know we can't do this on our own. We need to bring in as many allies and educate them and bring them on the journey with us. When we do that, like, you know, the, the success, the, the cultural shift is when it, that is happening. You know, we're, we're really at the cusp of something very special, as I've said earlier. Um, and again, we, as I say here, we couldn't do it on our own. Like that's what, you know, I'm, we're really looking forward. We're working with Moria and Leinster and Bank of Ireland to bring this educational piece to the next level here in Leinster. Moira, it's interesting. Rainbow Laces, Craig, you might have giggled. That you've probably seen me make a mess of this all the time, right? But so we have to do the Rainbow Laces. We like doing the Rainbow Laces week, um, weekend on BT Sport, right? And then I have to go with LGBT and I forget the letters in it. And then I mix it up with the big friendly giant with the kids watch, which is, which is the BFG. And I get all the words mixed up. And it's got to the point now I'm so insecure about it that Ben K and Lawrence Shalley sit back and watch giggling when they know I have to do it. It's Rainbow Laces weekend is to put LGB. No, is that the big friendly giant? Is there a Q in there as well? I get so confused because I'm so worried, Moira, about mm -hmm. making a mistake and upsetting people. And it's something we've spoken about quite a lot, whether it's, you know, any kind of inclusivity, getting rid of any kind of stigma, we need to normalize the language so yeah. people don't feel uncomfortable about discussing these things. How do we do that? Well, um, it's a really good point. I get the letters mixed up myself sometimes. And I think it's, again, about creating an environment where people are safe to engage and be open. If that means you get the letters screwed up in the order of it and you put in, you know, plus, minus, square root, whatever it happens to be, as Jack said earlier on, there's, you're, you're engaged for the right reasons. You know, if you make a mistake, that's, that we, let's not focus, let's not, I, I think that something in our work and, and when, when we start doing this, like the inclusivity committee, I remember we were setting it up. I kind of said to myself right now in my mind, I thought, no, you need it nice and small, you know, so we'll get loads of work done. So you need a huge committee, it'll take us ages to get it. So then I thought, well, we have to have somebody from this, someone from this, someone from this. We have a committee of 16 or 17. It's a big committee. And um, this is just a little analogy. This, so if we look at a little, uh, what do they call it? Microcosm of something and apply it to the bigger picture. So we're on the inclusivity committee. We've got all sorts of shapes and sizes and people from all sorts of backgrounds and all sorts of experience. And uh, I thought to myself as the chair of that, what's my job? My job is to create an environment where people are safe and secure to, funnily enough, I didn't say to agree, to disagree, okay? Because in my view, you know, that's how you collaborate, by being safe to say, look, Craig, I don't even know you, you know, really, we're only just meeting on this, but I've got to say, I think you're looking at it from a way, maybe that's too narrow, or I don't agree with your point. And a whole bunch of 16 or 17 people of different age groups, different walks of life, not knowing one another, my job was to create that environment where we could really work and engage with one another. So let's transfer that to the conversations that we're going to try to be getting people to have in clubs around the issue of LGBTQ plus uh, in sport and in rugby, in their rugby club and in their community. I think that's what we want to try to do, just to say, we want to normalize it. We don't want everybody to feel, oh, God, can I call you a girl? Uh, can I call you a woman? What do, what, what, what do I say? Um, you, you know, you, 
you look someone in the eye and you shake their hand and you say, hi, nice to see you. And when they're leaving, it was really lovely having a chat with you about the girls rugby. And anybody who knows that you're honestly engaged with them, really, if they're not happy that you use the word girl instead of woman or something, I think that's a stymie to us getting anywhere. Um, and we need to be have a little bit of little bit of give and take when we're having these conversations, um, you know, in, in clubs, the length and breadth of the province and the country and the world, I hope. Um, but it's creating somewhere safe for everyone um, to, to try it, uh, to try and use language, you know, that they maybe ha aren't used to using. Um, and for, let's say, very often with me, I'd meet an older man in a context of this, a, a, rug a rugby man, if we call him that, and he'd say, I, it, that, that's great to see the girls coming up and say, oh, sorry, sorry. Can, can I say girls? And I'd be like, yeah, look, that's okay. Let's talk about it. Why is it great? Why do you think it's great? You know, I think it's great that you're a 75 year old man who's played rugby all his life. And you think it's great that the girls are getting more and more exposure, that the girls are being seen, that the girls are being given. I don't care that you're calling them girls. I think it's great that you are aware that it's happening. You're engaged with that it's happening. And that's, that's, that's what we need to try and create. And that's what Lens are going to try to help clubs to do. I think that's important. Brilliant. Well, yeah. I've learned a lot of that, Richie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he's nodding away in agreement with you there. And she got all the letters right, Richie, in the right order <laughs> yeah. and everything. Good job. Um, I'm going to leave it with our players to, to, to wrap this up. It's been such an interesting chat. We've chat for such a long time. Um, Lindsay, Jack and Craig, there's going to be, I guess, the majority of people will be kind of quite connected with this, but let's just talk to the extremes for the moment, if you don't mind. The people out there who are maybe uncomfortable with this conversation, maybe they're just not as woke as you probably want them to be. How, how Lindsay, what message can you give to those people to be more accepting, accept inclusivity into their lives? And then Jack and Craig, if you could give a message to the people are watching you who might be gay, they might be nervous about coming out. They mightn't feel rugby is a place for them. Uh, how can you help them and, and comfort them in making that decision? Lindsay, I'll start with you. People out there, maybe just give them, a, give them a helping hand here. Maybe they need some help. Yeah, I think they need to, to ask themselves why they're so uncomfortable with the conversation. Because if you look at it, it's not about them. It's, it's about a community that feels marginalised and not accepted enough in sport to engage in it. So it's it's not about them. It's not about you, really, if you're looking at if you want to be very open and make a change. It's not about you. It's it's thinking about um, the same. If we were talking about racism, if we were talking about gender inequality today, we're talking about LGBTQ plus. And it's about like what the stats and Richie has said to them. We've seen it. it there is need for rainbow laces. And and I seen a tweet by um, actually Jordan Henderson had up uh Someone responded to him from Ireland saying, you know, they, they wore the pride uh, captain's armbands. And he said, you know, what, I felt very uncomfortable when I came out at 17. And the fact that when I found felt, found a home in Liverpool, that Liverpool Football Club acknowledge the LGBTQ plus or the pride flag. Uh, I felt so connected to that and I felt so accepted and empowered. And it's those little gestures by allies and by people who understand that you need to make these gestures and visible gestures and of support to make people feel comfortable because at the end of the day people should be able to live their lives um as they see fit and what makes them happy and that's the main thing um it's not your choice it's not your life you're living it's it's about making fe people feel comfortable and um, to be that we've only one crack at this life you know what i mean and i think there's enough going on in the world so yeah, just enjoy, enjoy people's enjoy happiness. It. Yeah, it's it's actually yeah. harder to be miserable than to be happy. And I've learned that the hard way in my own personal journey. Um, and I did a thing with David Goff last week and the same thing in GAA. Um, he came out, I think, officially in 2012. And he's still the only openly gay um, member of the, the GAA. So kind of mirrors exactly what we're saying here today. Um, we need to have these conversations. We need to be putting in our diversity inclusion committee and having these conversations to, to change the social norms and, and what, you know, what we're here about today to make people um, open and happy. And yeah, and people might surprise you when you tell I remember when my brother, my brother came out all those years ago at the dinner table to my mum and dad. And do you know what my dad said, who played in St. Mary's all his life and got proper rugby, I looked at him and went, oh, Jesus, I always thought it'd be you, Craig. <laughs> 
So that, and you know, and God, God rest his soul, he's not with us anymore. But my mom loves my brother's husband. They're great. They get on great. You know, so these people that were stuck in Catholic Ireland, they can change. They can accept. So they might surprise you. Jack Absolutely. and Craig, people at home, young boys, girls sitting at home now going, it's tough out there. You know, I really want to be honest and tell people who I really am. What help advice can you give them? Yeah, I suppose, as Craig was saying earlier, it really can be a massive weight. And if or when you finally do to decide to come out, it, it really does feel like there's a weight lift off, lifted off you. And not every interaction you're going to have is going to be completely positive. But in my situation anyways, it's 100% worth the, the badge. was definitely worth the weight being lifted off. And Craig? Yeah, no, I agree with that. I think... It's always difficult giving advice. Everyone's journey is so different and so unique, but I think I made the point. I think Lindsay made it feel like a jump and a leap of faith, but yeah, trust and don't doubt the people closest to you. Um, you'll, you'll be surprised. Well, you will, you'll be surprised, but you shouldn't be surprised how they react positively. Yeah. And treat it as a filter. It might get rid of the assholes out of your life. Yeah, I think that's another point, if, if I may just cut in there. Um we kind of, um, and especially with social media, we, we're kind of caught up, and I'm a victim of it myself. We caught up about what the world thinks of us. But if we think about it when you're really struggling, I have to bring myself back down and remind myself, who are the people that really matter to me? And how do they make me feel? And, and how have they responded to me? And, and, and it's hard. It's hard because we judge ourselves and what everyone else thinks of us and this level of perfection or this social mold that we're meant to fit into. And it's okay not to. And it's OK. Um, I'm trying to remember, Richie, the, the Dr. Zeus, you know, um, the people who matter don't mind. I'm raging now. I don't have it. But basically, there's a Dr. Zeus quote that basically said, you know, it's, it's about the people that matter to you and their opinion of the most and how much they love you. Because at the end of the day, they'll, they'll stand up behind you and support you as you would for them. And yeah, unfortunately, there is a lot of noise out there. But again, having these conversations, having the support of the big players like Leinster Rugby, Bank of Ireland, those big names that people really look up to and being role models as allies and support to the LGBTQ plus community. That's huge. And that sends a huge, powerful message to the world. And again, about calling people out, standing up on social media and say, that's not okay. If people are in your company, that's not okay. And that's going to change and educating people. And I think we're absolutely on the right path. You know, we've covered some ne negative topics here, but we're absolutely, thankfully, on the right path here um, to educating and changing and change the way the world is today. Really wise words, really. And actually, Richie, I'm going to do, I, I can't, we could keep going for hours. It's so fascinating. But the, just the power, this, uh, this is a really important message to leave with, right? For all the straight people out there, the power of their support as an ally and saying out loud, that's not okay to say that about that person. Talk to me about that. Absolutely. Like, um, and, and to be honest, we've had situations where we might have had a difficult uh, kind of leaving a match and someone might have been something said or whatnot. And we've invited those guys down to come and train with us to see what we're about. And we're all about bringing people in to understand what we're about. And, you know, when we educate those allies or we bring in core allies, they're always working in the background, sometimes unknown to ourselves, that they're, you know, constantly chipping away or delivering that message. And the ripple effect of that alone is massive, you know? Um, to call out, yeah, we're, we're like, like we have to do it ourselves. And to be honest, Craig, we, in our own community, we are, we're, we're like, we're always saying to our lads, like, okay, we may not have a huge amount of role models, but we need to be the role models that we never had. And we also need to be championing the, you know, if we see, you know, we had to educate our whole, ourselves and the whole trans community. We didn't you know understand that enough inside the club. And we spent a lot of time on that last year. So we're constantly, and we're very aware of, we need to, as our own, club be upskilling ourselves understanding you know making sure that we're bringing in a very diverse membership to the club but um yeah on, on, on the ally piece like we would not be the success we are today and we have like the allies that we have you know also within Leinster within Bank of Ireland it would help us it go forward it, it, it's just been extremely powerful in the last three four years just make all this, normalise all of it. I'm going to end with a quote from the Bar Council Chair, Maura McNally, actually, Maura, and she said, you know, someone shouldn't have to shout from the rooftop, I'm gay. I don't know any straight people who have to run to a rooftop shouting, I'm straight. Make it normal. 
let's crack on and have a nice life. Um, Richie, thank you so much, Maura. Thank also, you, thank you so much. Lindsay, I know you're going to keep playing until you're 50, which is obviously decades away. I know you will. Jack, best of luck with the injury. Hope to see you back in the pitch really soon indeed. And Craig, <laughs> thanks all. Have a thanks great so week. Much. Have a great summer. Thanks for your Thank time. Thank you very Take much, care. everybody. Thank thanks, everyone. Craig. Thanks, thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks bye bye. Bye bye. Well done. Thank you. Bye bye. Well, a huge, huge thank you to all our guests for their honesty and their passion. Really, really interesting to hear all your stories and how excited you are about the future, because that's what we should be doing here, realising that actually maybe the world is becoming a better place, certainly in our sport of rugby. So a big thanks to Moira and Richie and Lindsay and Jack and Craig and for all of you for watching as well. And also to Bank of Ireland and the Leinster Rugby Inclusivity Committee for hosting this webinar. There's a lot done there's an awful lot more to do and we're all on the same team for that not just our panelists today but all of you watching as well keep a keen eye on leinsterrugby.ie over the month of june for more stories inspired by pride and also check out rainbow laces online to see how your club and you can support this brilliant awareness campaign thank you so much for your company take care of yourselves and see that fly just then bye bye